Uh, so, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the IMA Healthcare Alumni Special Interest Group uh, webinar series. As you know, the uh, alumni special interest groups at IMA are platforms that bring together alumni, faculty, and students, and leverage the uh, collective intellectual resources engaged in specific areas such as healthcare, education, technology, analytics, public policy, etc. Uh, to bear on uh, some of the most challenging issues of our times. Now, faculty and alumni are already making stellar contributions, but the ASIG platform allows uh, them to collaborate with each other in a much more, uh, uh, much more intimately and to engage with industry and practitioners in a much more capacitive manner. Uh, to facilitate this interaction, we have created 14 such ASIGs and more will follow in due course. The uh, IMA Healthcare ASIG webinar series uh, brings the thoughts, views, and expertise of uh, renowned experts to the IMA community. As part of the series, we have uh, addressed industry-government collaboration, emerging digital healthcare scenario, and investor perspectives on opportunities in healthcare. But the speed and manner in which uh, things have changed, and uh, as a result, the landscape is evolving, it has led to a lot of us to wonder what the future might look like, right? And uh, uncertainty certainly abounds these days and uh, technology already was moving at a very fast pace, uh, but you know, then comes along uh, COVID. Uh, policy is still trying to catch up and obviously it will take some time, uh, but that certainly merits a deeper exploration and what the future of healthcare holds from a different perspective. Now, today's topic of uh, reimagining the future of healthcare creating an enabling framework uh, deals with that in part. We have a very distinguished panel today to address this issue uh, and they share their thoughts and perspective on this. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Gautam Khanna, CEO of Hinduja Hospital, Dr. Om Mantrachanda, Managing Director, Dr. Lal Bath Labs, uh, Mehan Khan, Managing Director, MSD India Region, and Dr. Ratna Devi, Vice President, International Alliance of Patients Organizations for Patient Safety Observatory. The session will be moderated by Dr. Shailesh Ayengar, Senior Advisor, Goldman Sachs Merchant Banking Division. Welcome, everybody. We look forward to an exciting session. Now I hand over the platform to Shailesh to take over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Anurag. Um, may I request all the panelists to please keep their uh, video on uh, on mute? Uh, I think Dr. Ratna Devi, you probably will have to put it on mute. Uh, so, uh, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to be um, as, a, as a moderator uh, on a session, which is perhaps the most topical session that one can imagine. Uh, a year ago, nobody gave a, an iota of chance that healthcare would become one of the most important topics uh, when it comes to the decision-making with regard to who will be the next president of the United States. But that has been the impact of the pandemic that we have seen the way in which the government responded was the major issue on which the election was fought and we know what the results came out with. Uh, but also a year ago, if this was the topic that we had to imagine, what would be the uh, healthcare scenario in the coming decade? Uh, and uh, at that time, probably we would not have imagined what really transpired in the last one year. Uh, and that also has shown that healthcare would become and will always be the most important priority for every nation. In fact, the relationship between nations will be decided on the way in which we uh, prepare ourselves for the future uh, events, uh, learning from this pandemic. So when we talk about a digital transformation, which is the buzzword today, uh, I think that was there even uh, before the COVID times. But what COVID has brought uh, to the absolute forefront is the speed at which the transformation is happening. And for us to understand that transformation, we need to go to the value chain of the healthcare, starting from understanding the disease and diagnosing the disease. As Dr. Om Chandra, um, Manchanda will talk to us, but I can tell you that in his article very recently has written and that's been circulated to all of you, that although the cost of diagnosis is just 5% of the healthcare spend that we have, 
70 percent of the treatment decisions are taken based on the diagnosis that is arrived at uh, by the doctors so this has become even more pronounced during the covid times as we all know that for every activity we had to go and get ourselves tested for covid and post vaccination also there is going to be more and more testing that's going to happen whether it is for uh, uh, understanding the immunity that we have developed or even for traveling any parts of the world, diagnosis is going to be one of the most crucial part. So let me begin uh, by asking my uh, esteemed colleague, Om, to talk about a little bit of what he see, sees as the stellar role that diagnosis, diagnostic labs have played and how tech-enabled diagnosis in future will become the mainstay. We want to understand more about the innovation culture, the policy framework which would be needed for the future of the diagnostics uh, industry. Who better than Om to talk to us about that? Over to you, Om. Uh, thanks, uh, Shailesh, uh, for having me on this panel. And good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, as Shailesh rightly mentioned that COVID-19 has been one one of an event which actually has uh, disrupted the whole world. Uh, nobody is spared from this pandemic. Uh, healthcare actually has been like, a, it's like been a tsunami for all of us. I call this a stress test for uh, our business model. And I think um, all the teams that are engaged, especially on the service side of healthcare have been um, uh, through quite a traumatic time. And there have been a lot of learnings for all of us in this, and I'll I'll spend a little time on as to how I see technology playing a role in diagnostics, especially. As Shalish mentioned that I recently wrote an article on pathology industry, and I thought of, to save time, and I circulated that link. If uh, any one of you is interested to know as to how this whole pathology industry or diagnostic chains have come up in the last 15, 20 years, and what role it has played on, on you know, three basic things like affordability, accessibility, et cetera. Uh, that article may actually give you a little bit of a background to what I'm trying to say. Uh, getting into the question that has been asked to me, uh, any, any diagnostic platform or company is built on three building blocks. One is, uh, it is actually built on trust. Now, some of the things that I mentioned here is true for uh, for all healthcare, including hospitals as well. But it's extremely true for, for diagnostics because it has a very high credence value. It is just a blind trust patient has on a report which is given to that person. So the trust is most important because a patient gives you a blood sample or any other body sample. Uh, all you give that person a report uh, where a doctor or the patient have to trust what has been mentioned on that report. And it is presumed to be accurate report. Now, to me, that's the core of this brand. And any, any uh, diagnostic player, uh, if, he, if they want to succeed in this business, has to earn the trust of, of the customer. The second important uh, building block in our business is service. Now, once you have given the sample uh, you are expecting a report because the patient anxiety is building up and you just want a quick turnaround time. And that's a second building block. And third is being accessible. Uh, earlier, there were times when patients used to walk across to your center, they will travel two kilometers, three kilometers, 10 kilometers, but now they're expecting doorstep services. So you want brand to be accessible and the brand which is trusted brand uh, should be at your doorstep is what the expectation is. Now, the question which has been posed to me is that how do I see technology disrupting this? I personally believe that uh, these, the last two building blocks, service and accessibility, are in for disruptions. And uh, our operating models actually have been rapidly changing. And uh, there is a rapid shift to a third party network. Uh, if you trace our history, we started collection on our own, then it became a franchisee network. Today you have a phlebotomist roaming around where people are actually entering into our system online, paying online, 
and they want somebody to come to their doorstep and collect the blood sample. And all of us have experienced this and COVID-19 has been, uh, there has been a huge shift of consumer preference for home collection services. So all in all put together, I think the service element of diagnostics is up for disruption. And one has seen technology playing a role in other industries. And I think diagnostic is gonna be next one. Uh, the second area where I feel technology is going to disrupt is, uh, which may not be in the short term, but I do believe in the medium term that's going to happen, is that people are expecting, can I get the report immediately? Why do I need to wait for a few hours? A sample has to travel to the lab and the report has to come back in the evening or a few hours later. Can I get something instantly? And I think that's where the point of care testing is coming. Uh, I know it has had bits of challenges, both in terms of quality and affordability. I think with time, both dimensions are getting improved. And I do believe that uh, along with the service side or testing side, I do believe that point of care testing is going to play a big role. I think just to sum it up for these two areas of technology helping service levels and technology helping uh, the point of care testing, uh, are going to be two disruptions that I see in this diagnostic space. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Om. That, that, was, that was excellent uh, in order to really understand how diagnostic labs have become the mainstay uh, in the psyche of, uh, of patients. Uh, and, and everybody is talking about it. Uh, that has been the a huge shift that we are seeing. And with that, the expectations are also going up. But you have beautifully explain how things are likely to change going forward. But the same thing I can say about the pharma industry and Rehan uh, who represent the industry uh, at one of the high, one of the best known companies in MSD. Uh, Rehan, we have seen that during the pandemic, the role of pharmaceutical industry uh, has been uh, applauded uh, by everybody, uh, right from uh, in, in our own country, prime minister downwards, everybody realized that uh, when the crisis hit, how pharma industry actually came to the front and uh, whether it was in terms of collaboration between various companies to produce the vaccine at the breakneck speed, which we have never seen in our lifetime, or whether even providing some of the treatment options uh, that are currently being tried out in various parts of the world. So to that extent, I think pharma, the, the pharma industry has played a stellar role. Uh, going forward, we are seeing uh, and many, many changes that are happening with regard to digital transformation. We are talking of personalized care. We are talking about digital therapeutics, a new buzzword that we are talking about all over the place. And the current business models are changing. What do you think we can expect in this area going forward from the industry? Thank you, Shalesh. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to this webinar. Um, if, you, if we look at technology in healthcare, Shailesh, I think I want to share three, you know, three points with, uh, with uh, our participants. Number one, the revolution in technology is already here, but in pharma, we're late to the party. You know, some of us you know, have been waiting to enter the party. Some of us are in some other party. Some of us, so a very small segment of folks are utilizing really technology in an effective way. And the issue here is that Technology is here to stay. If you look at health tech funding uh, globally, this year it was nearly $30 billion globally. Out of that, China got 30%. We got 10% in India. Uh, the other piece is that if you look at health tech, technology and health, all kinds of tech, software, hardware, et cetera, uh, you know, today that market is about $7 billion in India, which you know, to most of our participants seem quite large. But in three years, this market will triple and get to the size of the pharma industry. So get to almost $20 billion, what pharma industry is today. So my sense is that, you know, in within five years, the health and technology market will trump the size of the domestic pharma market. So that's kind of my first point. The second point is that, you know, Lone Rangers, solo players, these can only be on Netflix now. You, you can't be anywhere else. You, you, if you are a company that want, wants to go at it by itself, pharma company or otherwise, that's very difficult to do because most of our customers, you know, whether it's Gautam at Hinduja or anyone insurance company, they want a solution. And that solution is almost never just a pill. Uh, it's a pill plus diagnostics, 
uh, hardware, software, you know, some kind of tracking device, uh, so a platform. And, you know, I'll give you an example, you know, for example, you know, in on the diagnostics industry, we have a product, uh, you know, 20, you know, $14 billion product globally called Ketruda. Uh, but in order for you to be prescribed Ketruda, you know, for lung cancer, breast cancer, and other uh, debilitating diseases, uh, um, immuno oncology product, you need to have some targeted testing done to, to test for a protein called PDL1. Now, in order to test that, we need a diagnosis lab. So without that, without that part, simple partnership, we, we cannot get that product prescribed. So, so therefore these partnerships are gonna play a, a very important role. The third piece, um, and perhaps some of our participants are interesting from a career point of view, you know, talent is no longer sectorial. Talent is very broad, very generalist, skills are portable. Uh, so you're not a pharma person anymore. I think certainly when I started my career, you know, you know, it was a fur coffin that you laid in and hopefully things carried you along. Uh, that's not true anymore. Um, you could be in FMCG consulting, you could be in a hedge fund. We have many people in, in MSD who've come from a consulting background, from FMCG, from banking, even um, private equity. Uh, so therefore, skills are portable. So I think those three points. And then if I look very quickly at three areas that I'd just like to you know, shed some light on, uh, there are probably 20 areas we could talk about, but let me just share three areas using a company as an example. So uh, three areas, digital therapeutics, personalized treatments, and early detection. Because, you know, if you look in our country, if our participants can just think about the three things that are, or four things that are quite important in our country, awareness, availability, affordability, and quality. These four things play a massive role in any kind of healthcare uh, access in our country. So if I look at digital therapeutics, there are companies like, there's a company called MySugar that uses your mobile. You can track your HbA1c, your blood glucose sugar level over a period of time. They'll provide you all that data, food, uh, et cetera, the kind you can eat to have your quality HbA1c. On your mobile, you can track it. You can also get personalized coaching. So both offline, online, software, hardware mixture. Second thing, if I look at personalized treatment, you know, Ketruda is a great example of personalized treatment. Um, you know, we have something like uh, 25 indications globally, breast cancer, you know, lung, number of other cancers. And you can go get tested for PDL1, God forbid, if you have one of those kind of cancers, and then be prescribed in that. And there are patients who've lived for, you know, more than uh, five, seven, eight, 10 years with a disease that was considered, you know, even 10, 15 years ago, completely fatal. Uh, the challenge is that, it, you know, what will technology help us do? It will bring the cost of testing down. It will bring the speed of testing availability down. And, you know, Om wrote a fantastic article, hopefully that everyone got a chance to read, that if you look at the fragmented nature of diagnostic labs in the country, um, you know, some of that with, 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 in partnership with, with companies like ours, but also consolidation will come down. The third piece to me is around early detection, because if you look at any disease in our country, let's take lung cancer as an example. Most patients present in late stage stage three, stage four, breast cancer, same thing. And effective, you know, reasonably priced portable testing really would make a difference in, in combining health with tech. So therefore needs of not just India, but many other, you know, 100 emerging markets, 30, 40, 50 emerging markets come into play there. And there are companies like NXL out of Bangalore, which are doing uh, quite a lot of work around emerging markets, medical devices, and companies like Niramai. So there's a company called Niramai that basically, again, out of Bangalore, uh, that does testing, you, you know, looks their thermal imaging to test for breast cancer much more quickly and much more accurately, most importantly, uh, five times more accurately than mammography uh, using algorithms. Uh, and it's a portable device, can be used anywhere. So, you know, what's happening on the health and technology side with whom all of us must partner uh, is very important. So those three areas um, and, you know, all of us should keep in mind awareness, availability, affordability, and, and quality. Great point, Rehan. Thank you so much. And I think you have really uh, set our minds thinking of what to expect going forward uh, in, uh, in terms of therapy and therapeutics. Uh, and uh, it does, just doesn't look like the one which when we started our journey in pharma industry. I think going forward, this is going to be a totally mindset change, uh, the approach that we're going to take. But similarly, what we are seeing is that the hospital group uh, and, and the clinics and the provider space has been in the forefront during the COVID times. I don't think Gautam, uh, as the CEO of one of the finest hospitals in Mumbai, has had enough sleep for the last eight to nine months. 
the amount of pressure that he must have undertaken and his team and 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 all the staff of the hospital uh, when the pressure was so high to manage uh, the, the the huge population of people who were coming with positive uh, covid results but besides that the whole role of uh, providers and especially hospitals their patients are now becoming a little bit conscious whether to really go to a hospital for necessary treatments because there is this whole fear of you know getting some infection like covid uh, that has also started changing quite a bit so gautam we would like to get a flavor from you as to what's happening in this whole hospital clinic setting post the covid 19 and what can we expect going forward uh, what kind of changes people are talking about teleconsultation and telemedicine and all kinds of stuff so give us a little bit of a flavor uh, as to what's happening in this so imp- such an important area of healthcare over to you go thank you selesh and uh, wonderful listening from uh, om and rehan and uh, i'm really uh, enthused by what they have told me about the sector actually i wish i was much younger so uh, so now coming to what you uh, talked about uh, in the hospital setting you know the last year has been a little uh, uh, tough as you mentioned so lot of uh, stuff uh, changed on the infrastructure side on the protocol side management of people management of patients so i think all that uh, everybody is kind of aware of but i have to uh, say this that this uh, past almost 9 10 months of covid has brought about a significant change in the mindset of the uh, country and the fact that government spent a lot of time on the uh, healthcare in the budget and talked about spending on infrastructure in the public uh, hospital space that speaks volumes about the commitment and understanding of the government of the health of the population for the good of the country so i think that's a good sign and we've seen many uh, citizens talking about insurance and talking about hospitals so now you, it is the buzzword uh, in the country so but, but before i move on to telehealth i just want to give a little context uh, selesh uh, for the audience and many people know that but just to explain to people that the covid 19 actually exposed the uh, infrastructure inadequacy we have in the country healthcare infrastructures for example you know uh, almost 60 to 70% of the hospitals are in the 30% of the urban areas so that means the non urban areas actually do not have enough healthcare infrastructure people have been uh, dealing only with the episodic treatment it's fragmented like om said about labs it's healthcare is very fragmented there are many informal providers and you know the there is a desperate shortage of doctors nurses the patients have to travel in the rural areas sometimes more than 5 kilometers to access a healthcare facility so so you add that and if you see the number of specialists so number of specialists for example the number of oncologists are less than 0.01 per 1000 mm-hmm. pediatricians again 0.01 per 1000 less than that orthopedics the same while if you compare the western countries oncol- oncologists will be probably eight times pediatricians 15 to 20 times of that orthopedics may be the same uh, if we if seven to eight times so there is a huge disparity in that so now what this pandemic told us that it is there is something called technology which can help uh, deal with reaching the population and we talked about telehealth and government uh, rolled out the changes in regulations and after that telehealth really took off so to give you an example uh you know there was a study done in september by eny and they have said that the teleconsultation market will reach 5.5 billion in by 2025 and out of which teleconsult itself will reach 700 million from 100 million which is 7x what it is today and telehealth is telemedicine is complete of including teleconsultation including teleradiology and other uh, things but the curious thing i just want to share that with you is the adoption how it will go in the future first let me give you a national statistics then i'll talk about uh, uh, specifically to us so when you look at the adoption southern region had the maximum adoption of around 62% west was 52% north 50 east 30 
and then you look at younger physicians more adapt adaptable and more uh, few, around 52% of metro physicians shifted to teleconsult while only 44% in non metros and out of this tele consultation only 15 to 20% people used some kind of a dedicated software otherwise it was phone call and uh, whatsapp so i think that is to give you a perspective and another side of the perspective is that government of india launched e sanjeevni portal and by december they had done around a million consults tele consults on an average of 3 minutes per consult so that means and that's free of cost they were identified i think in 10 or 11 states i can't remember but that is giving access to the rural and tier 2 population to the consultants and 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 uh, specialists for them which is a which is a big shift in the country now the other aspect of this is for hospitals like us we have seen i think more than 35000 video consults in the last uh, few months which has gone so the significant thing is that 35000 people have not come to the hospital and still got access to patient care so selesh what you were talking about they were scared about covid but that is you know that access has been given to them the other aspect of technology is that technology has been used for example we've used you know created tele triage so that if patients before they come to the hospital they have concerns let them call a helpline we will sort it out we will explain to them on and you know so there some anxieties are taken care of the other aspect was in for example when covid hit and people who were uh, not sick enough to be admitted to a hospital but still had covid infection they would be anxious that i am at home what do i do now so so you have to give access to a doctor so of course we have the home care packages where you know our doctors will treat them for 14 days on on tele consult basis and there'll be a counselor there'll be a dietitian there'll be a nurse who is monitoring vitals every 8 hours so that gives so you know this thing has caught on so what are now people looking at and i'm i'm saying this is a trend which is not going to die down of course some people will still want face to face consultation and our physicians also do a tele consult and if they decide that a patient needs face to face consultation they call them for a physical opd but the good thing about technology and what they are looking for now is you know like uh, om talked about they are looking at accurate they are looking at faster turnaround and i think the convenience now they got used to the convenience they also got used to the technology giving them awareness and education about everything so now average patient is quite aware about covid and and I, my personal view is i think what they are now looking at is can they use technology can the hospitals help them with preventive health care i think rehan mentioned about uh, preventive health care i think they are looking at it now they know what is the important uh, importance of that and if there is a way technology can be used for example you know virtual reality based rehabilitation for example we have something where you know you can you can do that and can i do maybe mental health can be done through remote because it gives you privacy and you can do it through tele uh, technology i think all those aspects will kick in later but let let me hold on here and come back to you uh, later let's see how you thank you Silesh. thank thank you god i'm thought provoking and very 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 uh, exciting ways by which we will address some of the issues that we are going to face and listening to you i can imagine uh, how, how you know the new things that are expected uh, going forward but talking about um, all these things whether it was ohms uh, vision or whether you talk about rehan what he spoke about what the pharma industry is doing or what the hospital sector would do for uh, the patients but we need to hear uh, from someone who understands the patient's needs no better uh, than dr ratna devi because we all know that at the end of the day each one of us apart from being professionals are also in some form or the other our patients or our family members are patients and we know how important it is for us to have that personal touch this technology and all that stuff is going to be extremely critical but will it be at the cost of personal touch i don't know but dr ratna devi maybe you could tell us that going forward the most impacted individual in this pandemic is the patient and can you tell us what's the what is the vision and what do the patient expect going forward 
in terms of reimagining the healthcare, how it will shape up to help the patient in a better way. Over to you, Dr. Tadi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ayengar, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting conversation. Now, uh, as patients, we say nothing about us without us. And, um, uh, you know, while it has been quite well accepted and um, sort of uh, embedded into health systems in some of the developed economies, um, in the context of India, it is still very nascent. I mean, the patient is hardly ever consulted for any disruption or any service provision or for any decision making, whether private or public. Having said that, um, the pandemic has thrown open a lot of opportunities as well as uh, challenges. Now, one of the things that we do when we talk about patients is a care continuum pathway. So we say that once the patient, you know, um, um, feels that there is a problem and uh, enters the healthcare system, there is a seamless pathway which the person navigates uh, so that, you know, the outcomes are good, the patient is satisfied and the caregiver is also happy with, uh, with the clinical protocols that are being followed. Um, so in if you talk about the pandemic, because of the, you know, uh, the lockdowns and uh, restrictions of travel and other stuff, um, the whole digitalization did play a very positive role because it opened up access to a lot of people who would otherwise have been denied, uh, you know, care and access to treatments. But what it missed out was on the care continuum pathway. So while small, um, you know, departments, specialties, hospitals, um, uh, diagnostic centers, etc., started their own, um, you know, initiatives to reach out to patients and start the provision of services, there was no dialogue between these systems. And uh, let me just give you an example, which will illustrate. So um, I'm, I run a very strong patient support group on stroke. And one of my patients, very young, 36 years old, uh, was stuck in Nagpur uh, because of the lockdown, suffered a stroke. He had no family. He had gone there uh, for his company's work, was staying in a shared accommodation with four other friends. At 2 a.m. in the morning, he couldn't get up, somehow managed to raise an alarm. The friends took him to the nearest hospital where um, that hospital did not have a neurologist. So they waited for two hours for the person on uh, duty to come and attend to him. Once the, once the doctor came, he said, I'm not a neurologist, I cannot treat, this person needs an MRI. And since the hospital did not have um, a scan facility, he was then shifted to another place where the scan was done, another two hours to get a reading of that scan. And then once the scan was given, they were, he was shifted to a hospital which had a neurologist and a neurosurgeon. And the treatment started nearly 24 hours after the stroke happened. So, um, uh, you know, how in, uh, on earth has this patient benefited by any technology or any advances in treatment? So unless you keep the patient at the center of everything you do and build an ecosystem around the patient, whatever the technological disruptions might be, they will not give you the desired outcomes. So I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities for the various sectors to speak among them themselves before they start charting out pathways. Because once you have built a pathway to bring somebody else and integrate that person into that system is going to be a challenge. So might as well start at the beginning itself where you say, okay, I'm going to provide this and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, refer to Mr. Manchanda's um, uh, pathological, you know, a doorstep delivery and, um, uh, point of care diagnostics and all that stuff. But diagnostics is not just pathological and then not all pathological can be uh, point of care. So how do you then integrate? And therefore, uh, you know, if, if there are things where you have multiple samples in multiple uh, conditions that need to be collected, how do you do that? Is it possible? If a patient has to have, uh, say, uh, you know, um, an X-ray scan and a uh, uh, stool or blood sample, is, uh, are there different systems that are going to work with them with different kind of technology? And if there are multiple technologies, so the doctor uses one technology to do a diagnosis and consultation, the pathologist uses a different technology to collect samples and give a report, and then the radiologist does a third technology, where is the patient? You know, uh, is the patient going to learn so many languages or so many protocols or so many uh, platforms? So you have multiple apps on your phone, each trying to reach out to the uh, different speciality. So the, um, in, in answer to your question, the patient wants ease, you know, ease of managing his healthcare and his or her healthcare. And that can only happen when there is an integrated care continuum pathway where each player 
is looking at the patient and putting himself or herself in the patient's shoes and envisioning you know how that person would want to navigate the um, healthcare system if he himself was a patient so if, when you do a business you really don't think of yourself as a, or as a patient you know but think of yourself as a stroke patient or a heart attack patient would you really want to have five different apps on your phone and try to navigate each app why don't you have just one that can then tell you what to do and uh, how to do it and uh, again you know when you talk of payment mechanisms if you have five different apps you have five different pay payment mechanisms as well and not everyone is so digitally savvy and that digital literacy is another thing so while people have uh, internet connectivity mobile connectivity um, there are language barriers so most teleconsultations happen usually in english or hindi though there are vernacular versions now but how many people really understand the english or the hindi version and if they are not understanding the question well are they really able to communicate to their care provider what their real signs and symptoms are and then if that is not true are they really getting the kind of care that they would be getting and therefore this whole question of trust that mr manchinda raised you know you are unhappy because you think you did not get what you uh, deserved and therefore there is this trust deficit and already there is a trust deficit and that will become wider so that's a big risk uh, and unless we start working right from the beginning i have a feeling people will start losing faith so i think it's important that we are right at the beginning now and let's start working towards making that trust deficit smaller by making communications clearer and having a more integrated system i'll, I'll stop there thank you oh my goodness that was that was hard hitting and uh, and uh, very factual but guess what uh, all of us are thinking uh, what you are saying makes so much sense Uh, a simple word like a patient expecting is uh, expecting an integrated continuum of care he or she does not uh, really care how you do it that's that's the right every human being has and i think we as professionals have to look at this and what you mentioned in few minutes it's opened up this conversation in a whole new area and that really takes me to a very nicely back to home we really talk about you know we had rehan talking about you know that there are going to be no lone rangers he mentioned and now ratna has also mentioned that this is not going to be something that can work out with five apps and so many other things so how do you foresee and, and now we have seen the importance of diagnostic labs you know a life cannot operate without diagnostic lab my friend who came from dubai uh, frequently for last 3 4 months he did 27 times covid test so you can imagine the amount of diagnosis diagnostic test he is doing so he is extremely he had never done this in his life before so do you foresee going forward there will be more and more integration as ratna devi was asking us in terms of provider pharma and a diagnostic lab to meet what ratna devi wants for the patients in terms of uh, a proper integration and can technology help us um, let's have a, a opinion from all of you because i'm going to touch upon all of to all of you so let's keep it short but really expecting your views on this thank you yeah thanks shalish uh very thought provoking comments by dr ratna devi and i fully agree with you uh, dr ratna when you say that there is a care continuum and there's a person sitting in front of a doctor is a human being uh there is a lot of uh, care which is required emotionally uh there is a lot of uh, sense of uh, feeling of being assured which needs to be given uh the patient needs to feel that uh, that person is in safe hands i think that's all being said and i think that's where probably according to me technology is going to play a role i think the first thing i want to say is that technology is not a replacement for existing infra either in terms of manpower or physical infra actually it is an enabler it takes it to a next level uh just to give you a simple math and i was while uh, gautam was talking about i think normally it is said that there are 500000 doctors in this country if through telemedicine if i can take this number 100 opds per doctor we are talking about 500 5 crore consults every day my i don't know i i have not done this math but my sense is that this will take the productivity at least five times now this is a very theoretical calculation it may not be very practical to reach that number but it tells you that what technology through teleconsultation can bring in in terms of shortage of manpower we have 
accessibility issue that we have. And all of us actually have done in one way or the other teleconsults as well. Now it may not replace uh, all the all the cases. There are certain use cases where we still need a in-person consult. In, uh, we need to see a doctor. I don't think I'm I'm talking about replacements. I think the question that you put together to me is that integration of these three constituents of uh, hospitals, labs, and pharma. It's a very interesting question. Uh, I personally believe that COVID-19 has brought in one fundamental change in this industry. In the past, I think the ideas and the capital both were be going after some other industries. I think COVID-19 is that disruption where uh, ideas are now coming and also capital flow is coming. The, risk, the moment risk capital start chasing these ideas, I think the magic will happen. And to me, that magic will happen if some of those issues which Dr. Ratna addressed in terms of trust, care continuum, all that accessibility of all that happens. And I am 110% sure that as we go along, you will not have all the answers on day one, but I think this train has left the station. It's going to pick up speed as we go along. I'm 110% I'm sure. Now, I think at the heart of this disruption is the moment you have an e-prescription. Because most prescriptions in the world, and especially in emerging markets, are physical in nature, that does not allow connectivity across various constituents. As a teleconsult penetration goes up, you have an output which is not a piece of paper, but it's an electronic output. The moment you have the electronic output, and interoperability between the two players, then you will see all the dots are connected, whether it is pharma or labs. I, I actually have a feeling that there is going to be a competition that who owns the patient, whether it's going to be hospital, whether it's e-pharmacy or there's an e-lab concept. But I personally believe that this may happen sooner than what all of us can imagine. I think this connectivity of these three dots, pharma, providers, and lab, is soon going to fall in place. There's one more thing that you, some of you may be aware that National Digital Health Mission is being implemented. Uh, we are, I'm participating in that quite a bit. I think once that health ID falls in place, you will actually have a repository of all these three coming together. But there are a few challenges as well. I must highlight that. One challenge is data privacy. Uh, it's being addressed by policymakers. Let's see how it goes. Second area is that a lot of medical establishments are uh, hesitant to share their information as well. So I don't know how that's going to pan out. And third is probably conflict of interest because so far these three pharma provider as well as lab being different, a conflict of interest is a little bit avoided. Uh, I don't know how that's going to fall in place, but there are a lot of triggers uh, which definitely will take this whole connectivity forward. Thank you, Om. I think um, buzzword ideas, capital, and technology coming together for the first time in such a force uh, for the healthcare industry. I think that augurs very well. Uh, and perhaps one day we'll address the, the cardinal point that uh, Dr. Ratnadevi uh, raised for all of us. But coming back to you, Rehan, um, you know, when Gautam was saying that he wish he was getting younger because there's so much to be done, especially now that the discussion has opened up in terms of, you know, how do we integrate everything for the benefit of the patients? So we all know that industry is now transforming with digital technology, uh, whether it is in supply chain or whether it's in uh, digital integration. Every sphere of activity in the pharma industry is now getting it's really catching up. We were so late, but now we are really catching up and trying to do everything uh, in this area. There are so many startups coming up. Give us a little bit of a flavor. Uh, what do you think about this transformation? And will it uh, address some of the issues that Dr. Ratna Devi brought us uh, uh, into this discussion? Sorry, I was in mute. Um, I think Dr. Devi, um, Om and, and Gautam mentioned some pretty critical areas. I'll just address one quick one. And that is around patient awareness, patient education. 
which I think is, is important for most patients to know uh, about the disease, managing the disease, engaging with the disease. And there is a lot happening in that area with a number of startups. And I think Om mentioned, you know, risk capital chasing startups. Uh, and in India, that's, you know, already $2 billion a year, hopefully will increase to, you know, three, four times that going forward, because there's certainly risk capital required in order to test many of these models. Uh, we, we have far from having arrived uh, anywhere in, in terms of, you know, the web MDs of the world were early starters in this area, but there's a lot, a lot uh, long way to go. The, the second piece I think is around, and I'll just mention one area with data, is around spurious medicines around quality. So for example, there's a company called Neurotag, um, which traces you know, the medicine right from the manufacturing plant all the way to the patient. And simple, clear, you know, easily implementable technology will really help us in the pharma industry because spurious medicines are a massive issue. Quality is a massive issue, not just in our country, but all over the emerging markets. Uh, therefore, both of these uh, technologies like this can really help the patient and certainly will help uh, across, you know, help hospitals, diagnostic lab, certainly help uh, pharma industry. So I'll, I'll pause there and um, and I'll uh, wait for your next question. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's very, very insightful. You know, how, how things are transforming uh, and changing and some of the younger players who are coming into this field are really reimagining the way in which uh, the healthcare can be delivered uh, at the doorsteps of the patients. Again, coming back to you, uh, Gautam, um, we have seen that, uh, you know, we talked a lot about teleconsultancy, the fact that, you know, uh, uh, OM gave a very simple but telling uh, statistics to say that we can, you know, you know, reach out to multiple layers of patients all across the world. If only we could use more and more of this teleconsultancy, um, which has incidentally in US has gone up from 11% to 46% in just one year. So going forward, what do you envisage uh, would be the model? Uh, will, will the patient have a hybrid kind of situation that they would come to the clinics and hospitals at the same time? Many of their conditions can easily be managed through teleconsultancy. Will it become the norm? Uh, what and and Dartna Devi said about the difficulties that patient will encounter because of language, because of uh, proficiency, and so on and so forth. So, give us your take on uh, on how you see things going to evolve in the hospital sector. So, Selesh, uh, I mean, very nice comments from everybody. And uh, to first talk to Dr. Ratna Devi, what she mentioned, and I am completely in agreement with her that <clears throat> patient needs to be at the heart of everything and. When we say patient at the center of everything, it means we need to have the empathy for the patient. And uh, she mentioned a little bit about uh, business. And I don't think we need, you know, I don't think people uh, enter into healthcare to do business. First, they enter to do service and then, you know, business follows. So I think the main desire is to still serve the population of the country. I mean, that's how, that's why doctors are made and hospitals are set up and so on. Having uh, said that, I think the, the uh, uh, I, the question which Om mentioned that who owns the patient and I'm going to talk to telehealth in a minute about that. I think this transformation which is happening in because of the digital uh, health mission and the technology, I think patient will own him, his or her own records and will decide. I will he, patient will decide where the patient will go, which hospital, which lab, which, where, and I think. Somewhere I see the transformation coming where the patient will have more power because now information will be available more easily about you know, the outcomes, the hospitals, the doctors, it's accessible. So for, for example, now you can reach any doctor anywhere and can, uh, can get an opinion. So you are not restricted to your local uh, neighborhood for a, and you have to rely on him. So I think that is one thing which is changing. Now, coming to the teleconsult, uh, the statistics you talked about in the US. So I, the way I think what will happen in India is that there will be multiple models. Now, in India, first model, which is the uh, obvious model, is that more patients will access the doctors directly. So, uh, you know, we talked about we'll maybe have 5x, 10x of, so if our number of doctors are there, we'll make 10x the uh, you know, reach to the patients. So for example, and I talked a little bit about the e-Sanjeevni. So now they've, so they have on an average around 160 odd uh, doctors talking every day on, you know, to various people. And, 
and and the fact is that people are able to reach that so that is one model which will continue so which which i say doctor to patient will continue on telehealth and if there is a need doctor will convert to physical opd so that hybrid model will continue third model of patients who are more comfortable seeing the doctor in person that will continue and probably be a significant part that's not going to go away the other model which i think is going to come here is what i call doctor to doctor discussion so for example a specialist in a metro or in mumbai like in our hospital may be talking to a general practitioner in a small town in in in, in you know in a far away place but that doctor has patients who have that disease and he has no access to a specialist so doctor to doctor consult tele consult will also be emerging as a model now it could be whether they consult each other or the specialist consults the patient through the local doctor that will come come the last thing which i come think which will come is the technology which is coming through the artificial intelligence so the the combination of you know the screening the large screening which will be helped through ai help diagnosis so they will tell and then there will be a consultation uh, later which could be a physical or it could be a, a tele consult so i think all these models of consultation will emerge and uh, maybe i just leave it at that selish thank you no thank no thank you i think that's very encouraging and uh, and and uh, one does feel uh, that yes Uh, if properly used technology would come in handy uh, to answer some of our uh, growing uh, needs for healthcare but coming back dr ratnadevi you heard uh, our panelists uh, giving you assurance that patient is at the center of everything that they are doing um with the with the more and more digital technology being used the question also comes about the the, uh, the data privacy how concerned are you uh, uh, with regard to that because uh, the the data that is generated out of this whole thing can also be monetized uh, and can be used uh, significantly so while it also gives a lot of insights about uh, you know the diseases the problems that the patients are facing so give us a little bit of a flavor of how concerned are you about the data privacy because of the uh, advent of the digitalization that is taking shape in healthcare okay i'll split that question into two parts um yeah about 70% of the country doesn't bother about data whether it's healthcare or otherwise you know the way we use um, uh, social media platforms and uh, other uh, you know apps that are there and all kinds of stuff that we download i think most people are unaware that data is important and that there needs to be um you know safeguarding of critical data and that's why you see so much of uh, banking frauds and other stuff happening so uh, coming from that perspective i think people are not bothered about data or health data or data privacy even if telemedicine or telehealth comes um, you know in a big way in the country there's a small section of people who do think about this and uh, amongst the, those are also patient groups who understand what data means and how it can be misused and they are concerned and they have they have started to raise their voice saying you know this um, this whole business of uh, going digital and having all these telemedicine and teleconsultations brings data into uh, you know many people's hands where the security might be an issue and especially with multiple players and uh, so many um, you know um, platforms coming up the government might have the right intent but no um, you know a power to regulate because uh, as with every other thing the regulation is the missing piece uh, because you have all the policies but they are never implemented the way they are and uh, the defaulters get away because the legal system is so poor in our country and therefore the people who are concerned are really concerned and that might drive them away from these platforms i see those conversations happening already however uh, the short answer to that is that the majority of the population just doesn't bother because they don't understand i think i think that's again a telling comment and i think you are absolutely right and i think the onus is on us who use technology to respect uh, the very essence of uh, of data privacy i know that we are running out of time and uh, i have uh, a couple of more only one major question to ask to every all the panelists it's very rare to get such a stellar panel uh, to come so to, to my audience i'm going to request you for another 10 minutes of your um, of your time 
because we are going to address some of the questions that you have already raised. Uh, but give me 10 more minutes and I'm going to just uh, conclude with this last question to all my panelists. And that is to say that, look, you have heard today uh, from uh, Dr. Ratna Devi and I'm, she's going to just, I'm going to start with her actually to say that, um, tell us what do you expect from our panelists? You already actually articulated it very well, but still, uh, how should you, how should they imagine the future once again? And then I'll go back to each one of them. So over to you, Ratna Devi, in terms of giving a message to our panelists because they represent individually industries uh, as to how they can be more patient-centric. Okay, thank you for that question. And the one missing piece that I see here in the panelists is the payers, which is the insurance. And, um, you know, and they play a big role as far as uh, digital disruption is, um, you know, concerned, because unless they come into the equation, how are people going to pay? And uh, as of now, many uh, are not really included. Um, and coming back to your question, um, most patients have their hopes on the private uh, sector because that is where they see all the disruptions happening, new technology coming in, access to you know, uh, path-breaking medicines that are not available in the public health system, um, lots of technologies for um, you know, new age uh, diagnostics that are happening in the private sector, which you would not possibly get um, maybe um, other than uh, AIMS or some other institutes, you would not get it in most of the public health uh, uh, you know, centers. Uh, so, uh, so the patient's hopes are pinned on the private sector to bring in, um, you know, cutting edge healthcare. However, uh, what uh, breaks those hopes or what disappoints them is a lack of transparency. So I think a little more communication, which is clear and transparent would be very, very good because um, most patients, and if you talk to patient groups, they get, you know, all kinds of uh, confusing messages um, and again, uh, this is possibly because the industry um, heads are not speaking with each other. So um, if there is a uniform messaging that is happening, uh, that will build the trust. And I come back to this trust word again and again, because people when, you know, it's not just a question of spending money. When people lose lives or when there is disability because they were not given the right information or they went to 20 different places only discover that they were going to the wrong places because they were not given the right kind of advice. It, it disappoints people and then they lose their faith and, and trust and their hope in the system. But, um, but everybody knows, all patient groups know that it's the private sector that's going to save them at the end of the day. And let's you know, build on that hope and trust and deliver so that we, um, you know, together jointly, the patients and the private sector jointly grow and bring the best healthcare uh, to the population of this country. That, that would be my, you know, request from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. As usual, you know, very direct, but, uh, but uh, extremely important uh, message to all of us. Om, let me come to you, your concluding remarks, uh, you know, how diagnostic industry uh, will change and adapt to this new reality and the expectation from the patients. So uh, I think if I look into the future, uh, India being a very large country, 1.3 billion people, I see that uh, one size will not fit all. Uh, we will probably see emergence of uh, multiple segments. Uh, I think when we talk about for one hour digital, we suddenly start thinking the whole country will go digital. That's not going to happen. I think uh, uh, it's a typical pyramid structure at the top. People are tech savvy. They are very educated. They are the ones who are going to be early adopters. I think at the bottom of the pyramid uh, in diagnostics, uh, there, there are lots of people who are not being, even being pricked in their lives. So I think the diagnostic first is the penetration level is going to go up. Uh, uh, I don't have data, but I think somebody mentioned to me that hardly uh, out of 130 crore people, maybe 25, 30 crore would, people would have ever gone for a diagnostic test. Uh, so I think there is going to be a larger penetration, tier two, tier three towns. That's one change which I see is going to happen. Uh, at the middle level, I do see role of this ease, uh, the electronic stuff that we are talking about, that's going to be the second change. I think at the top of pyramid, which I see a very interesting change that's happening, which is, uh, it's not about getting accurate diagnosis. It's also about getting it early. Uh, 
there's no point in being diagnosed at the stage four or the last stage when you can do very little intervention. Uh, there is a large segment which is emerging saying that how can I diagnose something which is happening where there's no symptom yet, but I need to know is something happening inside my system. And that's where I find uh, very interesting, it may be a little futuristic, but I do see a congruence of few things coming together. I think we haven't talked about wearables. Uh, we haven't talked about some uh, sort of med devices, which could be part of this whole ecosystem. Uh, we, I did mention about point of care testing. I think there are multiple interventions which are likely to happen, which is at the top end. I'm not talking about, this is not only the way of life, but I'm being a little more imagining the whole thing. Uh, this congruence of variables, point of care testing or home diagnostics and lab testing coming together and with lots of data being there might just, uh, and with the whole AI and machine learning algorithms, you can actually pick up a lot of things much early. Uh, I think it's, it's all about be, <clears throat> picking up something in the gray zone. It's much easier to pick up something in black and white, but then it's too late. A diagnostic is going to be play a big role in, in that gray zone area is what I see is going to happen. That, that's an absolutely fascinating, uh, 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 you know, um, explanation. Thank you, uh, Om. And uh, it's also very encouraging uh, to know that, yes, there is congruence that we would work for and reach one day uh, and, and the like-minded people and especially the youngsters who are joining this industry would, would make sure that that happens going forward. Quick word from you, Rehan, uh, knowing that the skills required for the pharma industry will change dramatically going forward, uh, still re uh, retaining that, uh, that passion for, uh, for healthcare and care for the patients. So one or two points, what do you think uh, would be the key learnings for us going forward in the industry? Thanks, Shalesh. I think um, three things. Um, one, if I look at the pharma industry today and, and why, you know, what we can learn from some of the other sectors, FMCG consulting and others, one, to, to attract talent, tech disruption has to happen. Most of the target group, TG, that we're looking at is, is very used to using technology as, as a way to interact. Um, and that's happening already. So, you know, I can give you lots of examples, but companies are using technology effectively to, to talk to the field force, engage the field force, et cetera. Second thing is um, many companies, many sectors, HUL is a great example, um, you know, have structured training programs and folks have gone from trainees to global CEOs uh, as a result of, you know, having exposure, not just to sales and marketing, but a number of other areas, manufacturing, rural, et cetera. And we have a program, for example, an MSD called a GMAC program, which sends people globally and, and gets rotated. Uh, so things like that. Third thing, um, you know, if I look at it, um, we are still perceived to be slow. The pharma industry, is, uh, when we go out to recruit folks, we are perceived to be slow. And part of that we perceive to be slow is many processes and systems, and therefore speed, agility, and demonstrable things where people can see things implemented would be very useful. So I think those three things. Super, that was, that was excellent. And that same question to you, Gautam, as we see uh, more and more people doing teleconsultancy, the doctors uh, uh, having, uh, you know, information at their fingertips uh, from the patients and, uh, and taking spot decisions. What kind of new skills do you see that would be required in the uh, hospital segment or the, or the provider space uh, going forward in the new future that we are reimagining? So, uh, Selesh, quickly, I think... Uh, the technology tells us about some skills which are pretty obvious that, you know, the hospitals at least need to have the skills of analytics and they need to be people who are need to be IT savvy. So that is a given. But I think this tele technology is, needs, is bringing about a change in the health practitioners. So they need to be more skilled in softer skills, in behavioral skills, in communication skills, because especially when there is no face-to-face -face contact, it's all tele. They need to understand the, you know, the, the signals and know how to communicate properly. So some things which are, which are acceptable in a in-person discussion may not be acceptable on a tele uh, platform. Then the other aspect is people, the skill needed would be more, as we say, adaptable and willingness to share information. 
because if you are not willing to share information across the ecosystem you will never have the integration and and when we are talking about having the empathy and putting patient at the center all this will be required and i think last thing will be that today hospitals are and and doctors and everybody are places where sick people go for treatment of some problem but i think future may be that we are responsible for maintaining the health of the population which is around us so really we may move from disease treatment centers to healthcare centers if if i can move that switch so that's what my hope is for future so i'll just leave it at that awesome excellent thank you and thank you my dear panel members you know i mean we can go on for another hour i know how much ideas you would bring on the table to really you know get this whole discussion going but some other time for that but let's just give five more minutes or seven minutes to some of the questions that are there already uh, uh, that i can read here and i want to make sure that there is a hard stop at 610 as i promised 10 more minutes uh, from our scheduled time so let me just start with a question that is there say, adding to ratna devi's point how are we going to address multiple consultation required for the same disease acute illnesses are out but chronic diseases are in themselves a challenge coming from shashi bhushan um, maybe uh, gautam uh, would you like to take this uh this was the question about the uh, how are we uh, how are we going to address multiple consultation required for the same disease because you know uh, patients would want to come back again and again uh, uh, and in this case would tele consultancy be the answer yeah after I, the yeah. I think the uh, tele consult is actually already answering that because for example if you take uh, chronic diseases like uh, diabetes so you you do a in person consult once and then after that it's a probably a follow up kind of consult and tele consult is probably more easier and uh, a convenient way of doing that and if you need to do multiple uh, consultations uh, with multiple doctors that also now tele consult platforms are providing options to do a group level discussion with two doctors three doctors so that also is a possibility so what earlier would you would have had to come to a hospital and move from one clinic to the other now it's possible to do so the options exist but i think this system will evolve in the future but it, it it's a for chronic i think it is a very good solution yeah i think i think that's very 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 yes sir, dr ratnadeep yeah um most often we forget that uh, when a, a patient um, you know uh, enters a hospital it's not just a doctor it's a, an ecosystem so you have a pharmacist you have a nutritionist you have a nurse maybe a counselor and and all these services are usually um, you know uh, taken in one go but in a teleconsult that kind of system has still not been built um so maybe that's where we need to head in the future so if if there's a diabetologist who is giving um a, a prescription filling for a per person who is um on diabetes treatment and that person also needs nutritional guidance and some kind of you know mental health counseling does it happen as one package or is this person sitting on zoom consultations for the entire week or the or maybe a fortnight that is the solution that we have to think about excellent i know there are couple of other questions but i promise that these questions will be answered by our uh, expert panelists uh, especially about uh, you know what will happen to the hospital brand if teleconsultancy becomes more and more doctor centric uh, and gautam will you have uh, sleepless nights on your pnl uh, thinking that uh, you know the importance of uh, hospital comes down a little bit with the uh, doctor taking the prominence here not at all <laughs> i think so. i i know I, i was thinking you would give the same answer so i can maybe add, add uh, 30 seconds of that is that when when doctors do well hospitals do well so we don't need to worry about that and when a, a diagnosis is done the uh, the patient has to go somewhere for the treatment so it is always better that a hospital which has enabled the doctor with services and there are things like what dr ratna devi just mentioned about the nutritionist nutritional nutrition and the you know physiotherapists and so on that ecosystem and sometimes like for example we do all your patient records are uploaded on the system and there is a record of your 
multiple uh, consultations over the years if it is available in one place that is the uh, that is the advantage of going through a hospital brand if you keep going from multiple doctors you will never have access to that record unless a universal record comes in so i don't think it's it's worry but i think in this system hospitals actually need to work together with the doctors to build the doctor brand that will really help great and um, as sunil kumar is asking and i'm sure everybody's mind it is that we all know that integration of various services are going to be the crucial part of servicing our patients the million dollar question is how will we do that i think that is where i think i will stop here and i would like to say that you know uh, when i passed out uh, way back in 84 from ima um, i never imagined that one day government will increase the healthcare spending by 137% uh, and uh, a dream that you know we will take healthcare at the top of the agenda of uh, of any country is happening now so i feel that the future is very bright i think there is light down the tunnel and um, i think if we can bring that empathy element that uh, dr ratnadevi and our panelists talked about i think we are going to be finding solutions uh, for some of the problems that our patients and we all face uh, in our daily life well i want to thank my panel absolutely brilliant and stellar in in your candid uh, responses and the audience thank you for staying back for more time than what was allocated and thanks to the sig group for giving this opportunity for all of us to come and share our ideas anurag uh, with that do we close this session yes shalish uh, it was a, a very engaging session and i uh, i was told that there were a lot of perspectives that uh, were added which you know at at first thought you don't think of so many uh, uh, angles to a particular issue but you know and i also must uh, compliment dr ratna devi while uh, we have a lot of service providers here but the patients perspectives were actually the ones that you know suddenly shook us up saying that you know <laughs> you look at it this way uh, so um, but absolutely brilliant panel and thank you all for being here um, taking the time out and sharing your wisdom thank, thank you. you everybody have a nice evening and a good weekend to everyone thank you thank you thank you bye bye